Tonight, uh, we're going to be having a presentation by uh, pastel artist Clark Mitchell. Um, Clark's going to be demonstrating tonight the use of soft pastels to create uh, a landscape. Work. And he's going to be using a photo reference that I had up a little bit earlier. Um, Clark uh, grew up in Colorado. Uh, near near Denver, and uh, in the 1970s, he moved out to California, and he currently lives in Katadi, where he's going to be uh, speaking to us from. So um, he's a, an avid plein air artist, and uh, Clark travels a lot to different parts of the country, actually, uh, to go to various plein air events, and he's won quite a few awards. Um, he has uh, been best of show at the Laguna Beach Plein Air Invitational and also at the Maui Plein Air Painting Invitational in 2011. Uh, Clark has also been designated as a master and distinguished pastelist by the Pastel Society of America. You can go to his website by going to www.cgmitchell.com. Welcome to my studio. Um, Claudia, thank you so much for arranging this and uh, helping me to get on Zoom at the right time, too. <laughs> uh, um, as I said, welcome to my studio. Um, I'm not going to give you a tour now. Um, Eileen suggested that I tell you about Art Trails, which is the open studio tour. And so near the end, I will tell you the dates in September when you can come in person, hopefully, um, we're all hoping for that by September. And uh, check out my Straw Bale Studio and see an absolutely packed studio. Seems like over the last uh, year, it's gotten more and more packed. Um, lots of work in progress, lots of work uh, coming back from galleries. Um, I'm moving my chair out of the way so that I can get going. This is a uh, fairly short, an hour demo. And I know these after, after supper uh, demos can be deadly. So uh, what's kind of nice is I don't see the audience behind me snoozing. <laughs> so no one will get embarrassed if they happen to uh, nod off. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the photo that I'm going to be working from. Um, Claudia has posted it. I think she sent it off this weekend. Um, it's from the top of Pole Mountain, which is in Sonoma County, looking down at a little tiny beach off in the distance and a heavy layer of fog that's pulling back actually within an hour or so, we were able to paint without any fear that the fog was gonna come in and engulf us. Um, this was a, a late morning uh, photograph and I don't know what more to say about it right now. I wanted to find an image that had both close-up detail and very soft uh, focus detail off in the distance. Um, I quickly looked at Doug Wagner's wonderful demo from I think it was last November, talking about um, atmospheric perspective and thought I would continue with that theme. And I will talk about uh, varying changes in value and temperature as one goes back into a painting. Let me start. Um, this has been up since you arrived. And this is an underpainting already applied to the paper. This is the part of the, the, the painting that uh, the lay-in takes me the longest, I'd say. Um, it's the most laborious, the time when I make a lot of changes. And then when I use liquid to affix the layer of pastel to the paper, also um, you kind of have to wait. So there would be uh, watching paint dry, and I know that that uh, loses the audience quickly. So um, I decided to do the underpainting beforehand so that I have a real jump on the um, painting in progress. You can see a little bit of what the paper um, started out as. This is Art Spectrum paper. It's a sanded paper made in Australia, but easily available on um, art supply stores around the country. 
And the color, I believe this is called wine. You know, I don't remember the colors, but it's, it's, it's sort of a, a deep reddish purple. And I like to work on that often. It, it really highlights the, um, the highlights, brings out the vibrant brights. Clark, Clark and, we, yes. we have a question. Oh, already. Uh, just about yes. what, yeah. Um, it, it looks like uh, you marked the photo for centers. Did you do that? And can you talk a little bit more about that? I always do. Let, let me go even farther back than the photo. Um, when I'm looking either on location or when I'm looking at a photo that I've taken or a painting that, I, that I, I'm working from, I use a, this is a, um, of course, a view catcher. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing as an artist standing there with their fingers out in front of them looking through with one eye closed although this is hardly a rectangle when I use my fingers. And this is an excellent rectangle, um, hard plastic. Uh, yes, I am sales, I, I uh, tout them because I use them for every painting. And once I found them um, on the market, it's like I, I encourage my students to all get them. So you, you can make it any format you want from, from square to long skinny to a typical rectangle, nine by 12, 12, 16, um, eight, 12. The reason I, I'm looking at it right now is, is some of the formats are marked on it. So when I'm looking at a scene, so when I want, first started looking at this, actually when it was on my screen, I go in a variety of ways. I think of, as I said, that long, narrow, horizontal, occasionally a very narrow vertical, um, square, comfortable rectangle, either horizontal or vertical. And I sometimes I will do thumbnails, little sketches of each one of these. Other times, um, I pretty much know right off the bat, okay, I really like this format. So I will hold the view catcher over my scene and um, do my sketches from that. So yes, I have made marks at halves and thirds on all four sides in my sketchbook. Likewise, I made marks at halves and thirds. I did a, over here was a little sketch of the beach off in the distance because I wanted to make sure to get the angles correct. Um, the reason I do these marks is for transposing so that when I go from this little thumbnail up to the large painting on, on paper, um, the same lines come in at the same places so that my thumbnail matches my large scale painting. Yeah, and we have it a all and we have a question again about, uh, can you tell us the type of paper that you use? Um, Art Spectrum. Art Spectrum, okay. Um, is this paper. Um, all, pretty much all the papers I use are sanded pastel papers. Um, meaning that they, um, they have a fairly rough tooth. I can't really tip this well enough in the, this light eh, to, so that you can get a sense of how rough it is. Um, but this is what the paper looks like when I started. Um, this this um, rich purplish red color. Uh, another reason I make marks at halves and thirds. One major reason is so that I may make sure there are not strong lines going right across the middle. Another reason with the thirds is so that I remind myself that a, a sweet place to have the focal point is at the intersection of these thirds. So there would be four places in any rectangular format that are these intersections of thirds. And to my way of thinking, create a more interesting place for the focal point than say right here in the middle. 
which again, this middle line reminds me, I don't want something major right here, either direction. So I worked from my thumbnail. I went to the paper that is the same format um, by using my marks. And then I, I drew in, laid in with a pastel pencil. Uh, this is an orange pastel pencil. I like a pencil that will, uh, it's the same pigment, but in pencil form. They are not easy to sharpen. I end up using a uh, number 11 X-Acto blade. Um, and the two colors I use the most are orange and then a pale yellow. So to, no matter what paper I'm working on, it will show up. And if you could get really close, you could see, maybe you can even see right now, there's some of that red still shows through, and I kind of like that. Uh, a little graphic look to, to, the, to start the painting. So when I do an underpainting, um, I'm right now in the middle of a, a series of, of five Zoom classes, and, and each class we do a different type of underpainting. Um, the type I use today is um, a little more intuitive. One thing I do, because my landscapes are so typically green, I stay away from green in the underpainting and use that more as an accent, as a, uh, a punch rather than overall green scene. Um, typically for trees, verticals, large darks. I will go with a dark, rich color, um, warm color. So often I will use warm colors underneath what's going to be a cool color. If I'm doing a spring scene, which we all know around here has already started, not really spring, but the green is happening everywhere. I will use warm colors for the underpainting. Then the green on top is a little more electric, a little more exciting. And so that's what I've done here. This was a large green tree. Down here were uh, probably oaks and bays on the hillside. This is a beautiful old oak that's up on the hilltop. Um, of course, greens. Um, pines off in the distance, conifers. Um, again, greens, but the, the closer I look at the painting, the more I see blues and gray blues for the, for the trees farther back. Um, so my underpainting right from the start can be exciting. And if I'm excited by my underpainting, it really helps me to get into the scene itself. If I have a blah underpainting, it's sometimes hard to work up the enthusiasm to, excuse me, a drink of water, um, work up the enthusiasm to really get into a painting. So what I use to affix the pastel, pastel, uh, dry pastel is soluble in all three of the typical solvents, water, alcohol, and turpentine products. Um, when I use a turpentine product, I use Gamsol, which is unscented, and one of the pure of the unscented turpentine products. If I use alcohol, I use rubbing alcohol and 91%. There's also a 72%, but that has more water in it. And on a few of the papers that I use from time to time, um, that much water will lift the um, flocking, the, the roughness of the paper off. Uh, that is, that's on, on a French La Carte paper, which is, um, I guess you'd call it sanded paper, but it, it's vegetable and cork fiber rather than a real um, gritty, sandy um, surface. So when I begin, Okay, so um, I, I take a brush, I dip it into my jar of alcohol or serpentine. In this case, I used alcohol because it dries so quickly. And then you go over one color, clean my brush on a pad of paper towels, go to the next color, clean my brush on 
pad of paper towels, go to the next color each time, dipping it in the alcohol to clean the brush a little bit. Um, not a lot of pigment sticks on because I don't really pile it on at this stage. There's no need. I'm not trying to fill up the tooth at this stage. What I'm trying to do is to get one thin layer of color to show me the various puzzle pieces in the um, jigsaw puzzle that I'm creating. Very flat at this stage. I'm not interested in the volume, the sense of three dimensions. Um, I'm happy to have it nice and flat. Um, in college, I studied um, ser serigraphy, uh, screen printing, and absolutely loved the flatness, creating the illusion of three dimensions out of flatness. Uh, but at the time, there weren't uh, water-soluble um, inks or paints to uh, paint, um, do screen printing with. And the cleanup was a horrible mess. I hated it, very, lots of chemicals. So I didn't stick with it. I brush it, then I let it dry. You have, your underpainting has to be completely dry, whatever solvent you use, be it water, alcohol, or um, mineral spirits, turpentine, um, it has to be completely dry or it's gonna do the same thing over again. It's gonna melt your stick of pastel as you apply the, the, the uh, pigment. So this is about the size that's ideal for me. I break my sticks into chunks. Um, there are so many different brands of pastels on the market and somebody's gonna ask me what my favorite is and I really can't say I have a favorite. Um, I use certain pastels, some harder, some softer at different parts of the process. And I can talk a little bit about um, brands if somebody is really interested uh, that I use at a particular time in a painting. Um, but if you saw my pastel box, which Two weeks ago, I totally reorganized, retopped up with all the little tiniest chunks, got replaced with bigger pieces, and already it's a, a big mess. <laughs> it doesn't last long, but it's so exciting. The, those few sweet days when uh, the, the box is all topped up and ready to go again. So this composition to me was pretty darn exciting. The, the uh, focal point was quite ready-made to my way of thinking. I have major lines, directional lines coming down here. The next layover comes down this way, not quite so obliquely. The next one is a little less, almost straight across. The shoreline is straight across. And then up here um, in my underpainting, I accentuated a little bit of cloud mass up above the fog so that I've got lines coming almost like a, a fan out from the focal point. To me, I'm gonna go in and do a little pruning and cut away some of the branches away from the trunk where it hits um, the grassy hillside. And right away, I made sure that in my underpainting, my lightest light and darkest dark, which typically or is a great way to draw the viewer's eye to your focal point, I made sure that that was very established early on. So this is gonna be the tree trunk, the grassy slope behind it. And I'm gonna make sure that I don't put foliage over all of that and bury it. And I've got all these great directional lines taking your eye right over here. It's not exactly on that sweet spot of intersection of thirds, but it's not so far away. So I will keep going unless I hear uh, that there uh, are Clark, questions. Clark, yeah. there, is, there is a question here about, uh, someone just says, how does the underpainting work? And, and I, I, I wanna add a question to that. Uh, what was your thinking in the selection of the colors that you use for this underpainting? Because I see a sort of a, um, a periwinkle color there for the, the shadows, and that isn't apparent to me. Yes, that's not yes. apparent to me in the photograph, but your, your eye sees something different. Uh, likewise, obviously the, the trees over here were all very green. And I, <laughs> Kind of an orange for the highlight and a little browner 
um, for the shadows. Um, for the tree itself was all sort of a maroon color. So, you know, I think we all develop habits over time. Sometimes under paintings, you know, with my students, I'll have them do the opposite color. Uh -huh. They complement as the underpainting for every color in their uh, photo. Um, these are colors that I have gotten comfortable with. These are shades of gray, gray blue. The turquoise here was very intense. You know, the ocean is, is off in the distance. There's a hint of turquoise in it, but I kind of over went, oh, went overboard. I tend to get a little extreme with color. You know, this, this bright um, reddish purple. Um, yeah. In this case, um, I use pink for the fog bank. Um, I tend to go more colorful than in the uh, source that I'm working from. And let's see, what else? Um, was there another question? Uh, there isn't right now. Okay, good. Uh, and I don't mind at all answering questions. Um, once the underpainting is completely dry, then I have to look at the, the, what I'm working on and decide, do I want, there's, there are three different places I can start. Um, if there's a large area of sky, I will often start there because I have to be pretty certain the sky is finished before I can do any of this um, silhouette work of the tree on top. Because if it, I decide I want to change a color, then I have to be very careful not to smear this, un, this color, the dark, what will be greens, out into the light sky. Um, another place to start and what I, what I was talking about a moment ago is at the focal point, my lightest light and darkest dark, establish those very early so that I know everything else in value has to fit within that range. And when I talk about value, I'm talking about the range from light to dark as if this were a black and white, like, like um, Claudia's um, television. Um, presumably was a black and white TV. Some of us are old enough to remember black and white TVs, where of course it was a colored world that was being photographed, but what we saw on the screen was a range from white to black and everything in between. That's what value is. And the easiest way for me to see value is to squint. You can look through a red film. Um, there are a variety of other ways, but um, to me, it's easiest just to squint and bleach out color and see relative light and dark. So the second way um, place would be lightest light and darkest dark, establish those early on. The third would be, is there any color that's really wacky? Because I do get pretty out there sometimes with my underpaintings. So a few colors, I, this intense turquoise is pretty wacky. This purple right here, which is the shadow of rocks, um, kind of boulders against the hillside, likewise, is pretty wacky. And as Claudia pointed out, the periwinkle and the hillside, the hillside is grasses, dried grasses. So that's gonna be various shades of tans and browns. This is going to be going a lot more brown, a lot warmer than this intense blue. Um, what I wanted was something that was very close in value. So if you squint, these two are very close, but one is much warmer. The vertical is more warmer and the, hor uh, the horizontal the oblique is much cooler. And I wanted to separate the two. So I'm going to start with the sky because it's radically going to change the painting. And I won't, I'm sure I will not get finished. Um, in this time, but I will do my best to work quickly on my brush strokes. For the sky, we're vertical. For the clouds, we're horizontal. For the uh, pine trees, the conifers, all through here, the brush strokes were vertical. And my strokes with the pastel, likewise, um, will typically follow those directions. Now this is a big expanse of sky. This is the sunny side, you know, it's obvious right from the start that the sun is coming from this direction, casting shadows this way. So I want my sky to be warmer and lighter 
on the left-hand side, richer, darker, and cooler on the right-hand side. Now I am going to leave a little border between the tree silhouette and the sky, because as I was mentioning earlier, in case I wanna make changes, I don't wanna have those two colors touching. And then I start smearing one to the other. If I have to do any blending, which I do quite a bit of, um, I don't wanna be smearing a dark green or brown or orange, whatever I put into this tree out into that pure clean sky. A lot of people over the years, when I do demos ask, how do you keep your painting so clean? And one way is I always have a towel over my shoulder. So as soon as I pick up a stick, look at, um, this is a, an intense yellow, but there's an awful lot of blue that got stuck on it when it bumped up against its neighbor. So I automatically, as soon as I pick up a stick of pastel, clean it off before I touch it to the paper. So that's one way that I keep them clean. My scenes clean. Another is by keeping that border between the two until I'm really satisfied with both colors. These are the tools that I use the most to blend with. Um, I don't even have examples with, of there are cardboard, say, sticks. They look like pencils, various fat and thin, and you can sharpen them on cardboard, I mean, on sandpaper. Those are uh, tortillon for the French name or stomps, I believe. Maybe that's the English name. I don't know where that came from. Um, I'm sure somebody in the audience does know. So now I'm going to use a, uh, a warmer green. Uh, excuse me, blue. This had more um, red in it. This was more in the ultramarine range. This is a little more in the phthalo range, a little more turquoise, and then way up near the, the where the sun is coming from, I'm even gonna use a pale yellow. And that's what I used underneath the whole sky was a pale yellow. And because I'm using sanded papers, um, there's kind of a rough texture to it. Um, some of the papers, uh, you, can, you can buy whatever roughness you want. And uh, one UART paper has uh, either six or eight different grips. You can go from very fine and smooth to extremely rough. Um, you get to choose. Um, over time, you know, go to an art supply store and just buy a, a sheet of this, a sheet of that, write on the back what it is, and you'll find what you like the best. The trouble with very rough paper is you can't blend with your hands until you get three or four layers of soft, dry pastel on the paper. Um, because it'll just ruin your fingertips. And rougher paper, of course, grabs the pigment, pigment that much more. So you use up your pastels a lot more quickly. Okay, I'm gonna start testing some greens. I rarely finish any one area in a painting right off the bat and then move to another area. I like to bounce around quite a bit. Um, So I might want a warmer green, something with a little more, uh, a little more olive green in the oak tree. And I want to keep in mind the highlights on this side, the shadows on this side. To re I want everything in my painting to reinforce the sense of where the light is coming from. And I don't use a heavy hand at this point. The tooth is raw, that's what I consider it. One of the reasons I do an underpainting is so I get one layer of very, very thin pigment on the paper and it's not really taking up much of the tooth. But the more layers you put on, the more the paper is grabbing the pigment and at a certain point, it's not going to take any more pastel. Likewise, if you start using very soft pastels, now the product, 
the, 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 what I'm using is called soft pastel, but within that category, there are softer and harder pastels. And there are some brands that are excellent for using on uh, raw tooth. Others that are better for using right near the end. They're so soft and buttery that you just want to do some delicate work on top. So a little more olivey. I'm still, I'm not pressing so hard that I'm filling up or covering over the underpainting completely. You know, why bother to do an underpainting if I'm gonna do that? Maybe I'll use a little paler uh, uh, a green down here with a little more white in it because it's a little farther away. Let's see, this might be a little too minty a green. Yeah, might be nice with a little more warmth to it than that. But I do like the idea of something paler. I, I sort of see that in the original. I could also use some of that paler color, dashes of it here and there. And I use the side of the sticks as far as I can into a painting. Um, pastel is terrific because it's both a drawing and a painting medium. And I consider painting with a pastel to be using the broad side and covering areas quickly. I consider the drawing aspect when I tip that stick of pastel up and start doing discrete marks. And that's what I love about pastel. It's excellent for both. Okay, what is really, you know, it's great. I can look at my screen. I'm not looking at all of you. Um, Maxine, you might be not even there. I don't know. <laughs> no, there's a lot of people in the meeting, actually, Clark. Okay, well, great. Yeah. So as you keep arriving, welcome. Um, <laughs> so I look at, I, I have a mirror across from me. So it's exactly the same thing. I am looking at my scene in a mirror. Likewise... In my studio, I have a hand mirror so that if I have a small painting on the easel, I, I can turn around and look at it in the mirror and I see it backwards and I see it at twice the distance so that I don't have to constantly keep walking all the way across my studio to see what I've got going. I can look in the mirror that's, that's halfway across the studio I, in the, the stand, the tall standing mirror, or I can look at the small hand mirror just over my shoulder. And when I see the work backwards, it's so obvious um, what's working and what's not working. What colors are too intense? Um, what color is really out of place? So looking in the mirror, I'm seeing this right here is extremely out of place. Kind of bouncing in a nice way off, off of this, but they both need to be toned down. So I want to start doing some um, dark browns, really knock down some of this purple. Uh, as I said before, the, these to me, it's a, it's a little hillock, whatever, with boulders on it. So I'm going to play it up as rocks. Um, as I pointed out at the beginning, I really like this swoop of an angle right here. So I'm not gonna get rid of that. I'm not gonna overlap too much. Um, but already that settled down quite a bit. You know, I might wanna try some, some just a hint of a little bit sharper lines here and there as the tops of boulders getting hit by sunshine. And so I keep complaining about this turquoise out here in the ocean. So I'll finally do something about it. I might leave it a little richer up front. Um, I'll probably get some more uh, closer to ultramarine blue in here. I'm gonna continue it on through the tree some. Um, the temptation sometimes is to stop, say, these conifers before they go into 
the um, oak tree. Now, I'm not talking about a, a border between a bright, bright and a dark, dark. I hear the value is very close between the two. So it's not going to matter so much early on that I might get some of this blue gray into the, the uh, reddish purple. Likewise, out here, the values are all very similar. From the, the, the fog, the ocean's darker, obviously, but then this cloud coming in from the side is, is very similar value. So I don't mind if those get a little bit um, mixed even this early. I'm gonna try to warm oh, Clark, up. Clark, yes. it might be a little awkward for you, but you, you, you are kind of standing in front of your work based on okay. where your camera is, so. Excellent yeah. reminder, thank you. Yeah. That's good. So the top of the cloud, I'm making a lighter color. The underside, a little bit richer, a little darker. And this is not in the photo. This I'm adding because I wanted, as I said before, to have some more of that fan shape leading the eye down into the focal point. Um, speaking of which, maybe now is the time to do a little work right down here. This will probably be my sharpest line is the outside of this tree trunk. Mark, we have a question. Um, this is back to the underpainting. Is it all pastel and then fixed with solvent using yes. a paintbrush? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. the, solvent, the solvent dissolves the binder in the stick of pastel. Okay, great. Great. Okay, I have a variety of warm colors. I use some pale pink in the fog bank. And I think that's going to play off nicely with the turquoise in the water. I don't want it to look like we're in the Cayman Islands or in Hawaii, so I, I will tone down the turquoise. But for the time being, I have, I'm kind of having some fun appreciating both of those. Maybe I'll do a little... That's actually not dark enough. I wanted a little richer blue in the water. That likewise is not dark. It's pretty much the same colors up in the sky. So I might go a little bit overboard, go a little darker because there are already a couple layers of pigment down here. This is the, the uh, paper is the, the uh, tooth of the paper isn't grabbing this quite so much. I'm tipping the pastel up just a tiny bit to do a little outline work along the, the beach down here. Mm -hmm. There's just a little tiny beach. I stay, you, know, you couldn't tell, I stay, I like a, a um, subject matter typically that has a fairly full range of values from darks to lights. But early on the painting, early on in any painting, I do my best and especially in the underpainting not to go really dark because sometimes it's hard to get light back into your work. This area down here might even be a little too dark. Um, I would have preferred it a little lighter. Um, so I, I do my best not to um, use darks too early in a painting and especially not to pile them on. So now it's time to start working in this middle section. This is a um, grayish purple. And it's a color I love. Um, this is not that brand, but Rembrandt has a wonderful grayish purple that I use in pretty much every painting. Now this is gonna be the darkest of the colors in this area. I'm using vertical strokes because I see these as all verticals, all these trees. 
The only place where I'll really tip up the pastel and start doing a little detail work will be the very tops of the trees. Um, where you can really see the shape of them, right? Let's say right there, maybe a little bit right here. Otherwise, I'm just letting the stroke, the direction of the stroke, give the sense of vertical trees. Now, this is all shade so far. So now it's time to come in with, and this is a mm, olive green. There's probably some ochre in it. And this will be more of the, the highlight color. And my strokes are gonna get smaller as I go farther back. The bigger, fatter strokes up close where I can see much more of the detail down into the, these trees, the differentiation between shadow and sunshine. Farther back, I see less of that contrast between highlight and shadow. So my strokes will get smaller as I go farther back. And I might, I, you know, as I said, I don't um, make all my decisions right away. This is probably about as far as I would typically go in one session. But, We've got 15 more minutes, so we're gonna plow right ahead. Um, I said that I used a pink for the top of the fog. Now I'm going in with a, uh, it's not even much lavender to it, it's, it's sort of a gray. It's a light mouse gray for the underside of the fog. I've noticed when I painted fog, that typically you can sort of see underneath it and down, it gets a little bit darker, not much. And I'm gonna to have to decide, have I made this strip of fog too wide? I wanted to make sure when I did the initial drawing, the width of the ocean is narrower than the width of the fog. Almost the fog at its widest is almost double the width of the ocean. So I think I've got it down pretty well, but I'll keep that in mind. I wouldn't want two stripes the same width or three stripes for that matter, because I've got the, the cloud coming in up here. Now, soon, I'm gonna to wanna to start maybe bringing some blue into this cloud too and soften it, soften the very top of it. This is a good point where I would stop a little bit and look and say, okay, what colors once again are really out of place? Well, I haven't even touched this area, the shadow part of the tree. So that would probably be a good place to work now. This is not such a yellow green. This is a little bit richer, um, greenier green, if you will. And at some point I'm gonna to have to get the darkest dark in. Now this is where most of the manufacturers of pastels are coming out with specialty sets or have over the last 10 or 15 years. So you can go to the, your favorite brand, look them up at your local art supply store first. And if that doesn't suit your needs, then you can go online and find a specialty dark set or a pale set or a marine set that's mostly blues and greens, um, portrait set that is mostly skin tones. Mm -hmm. And so I've gotten in certain brands, very, very dark pastels. So here I have to be very light with my touch. This area is still pretty much raw too. It only has the underpainting. So if I were to press too hard, I would get this dark, dense color that almost looks black. But what I want is for a lot of that nice purple to show through. 
Now, at this point, I'm not too worried. Look at all the sky holes in this oak. It's just littered with, with uh, little to big sky holes. I have some of the major ones in here, but I'm not gonna worry too much about them at this point, or otherwise I'd be working around all these little tiny things. I typically put the sky holes in near the end when I tip the pastel up and use it more as a drawing medium. Now, I want the tree to come forward of the uh, band of conifers down below. So here's the place where I will want to go a little darker right along the edge. Maybe not have some of these highlight colors in there too. Now this, this is a blue green. Now I noticed the foliage on this oak tree in the photo goes well down below the level of where the trunk reaches the ground plane. Actually on both sides, but on this side, uh, farthest into the picture plane, it really goes down quite a ways. And I find that kind of interesting. You know, typically you'll see the trunk and then everything, all the foliage is up above. So I like the idea that this is kind of going down farther than your average tree. You know, this oak's probably been here for a few hundred years. Looking down on that great view, wish I could go to the beach. When I teach my Zoom class, the students often turn their microphones off and I'll be telling jokes and nobody laughs and I feel so. <laughs> Oh, come on, I'm joking. I didn't hear any jokes. Yeah, well, that's okay. So I thought, looking at this, that was gonna be really dark brown. It's not particularly, but because it has a very light uh, grassy color next to it, it looks pretty nice and dark. And I'm doing a little bit of branch work now. Not much. Uh, likewise, I'll do that near the end when I tip the pastel up. Fatter, of course, the trunk is gonna be the fattest and the branches just keep getting narrower and, and narrower as they go out, more lacy. Um, I'll probably want some nice uh, strong line coming out this way as if it's coming down into this big mass of foliage. Okay, I look at my photo or at, at, at what I've got going in the mirror um, I'll get to this later on, but the values are really pretty much in the right neighborhood for the beach and the cliffs around it. What's really way off still is that um, periwinkle blue. So I want to find some colors that are close in value to that and just start knocking down some of that blue. This is a uh, mauve. It's got some nice warmth in it. And I might do vertical strokes at this point because these are all vertical grasses going down the hillside. And I'll just do some dashes of this color. And very quickly, that blue is tamed. It's not so intense. Yeah. And I could use some of that same color out in the grasses. I'm gonna want the lightest, brightest colors for the grasses up here, closest to where the sun is hitting that hillside. Also, this is vertical, or excuse me, horizontal. The slope is right here, and then it starts going downhill. So the sun is hitting these grasses at an angle, whereas it's hitting these across the tops. So maybe it's time to do a little more yellow. This is a uh, uh, creamy yellow. Later on, 
I will actually do some strokes up above. I can show you, I'll tip the pastel up and actually do some strokes along the top against the background. So it really reads grass. It's a little early right now to do too much of that. Now I'm still at the broad stage. And I can draw a lot of these strokes, the direction of the hillside and reinforce the sense that things are going downhill. Might even darken a little bit down here. Leave it brightest here, a little more subtle here, and then a little darker down here. Maybe go back to some more of that mauve. And by taking the grass colors over the edge of this blue, all of a sudden it's not such a um, chunk of blue paint, sort of. It, it, it gets um, buried a bit more. Maybe a hint of orange here and there. This is a pretty intense orange, but because I'm using a very light pressure, I think that's working nicely with some of the oranges left over from the underpainting up here. I was even thinking, uh, this is something I'd actually do very near the end, but just a few dashes here and there within the body of the tree as if sunshine is hitting a leaf here and there, a drying leaf, who knows? Now, at this point, I really have, I look at the whole scene and see if the colors are working together. There's still a broad blue band right here. You're looking in the mirror now, Clark? I am. Yes. yes thank uh -huh. you. <laughs> and then lo looking at it in reverse. Yes, looking at it in reverse. So I see what I don't see looking at it head on. Huh. Yeah, just up here, clouds are water vapor. So they will be very softened. So I'll do a lot of blending in the sky here. There was an awful lot of the roughness of the uh, paper still showing through. This might be a little strong or very strong um, that more ochre color that I had up there. I might bury this quite a bit with blues just to uh, make it a little more subtle, make the, the fog bank a little more obvious. Um, I haven't even gotten to gray blues in through here, but my underpainting colors were close enough to that value that this already is sitting back behind the trees right here. You know, I'm looking and I think I have six minutes. So um, do we have time for uh, questions now? Uh, we, we have time, Clark. If you need to go a little bit longer, that's just fine. We're not on uh, a heavy time schedule. Uh, we, okay. we don't have any requests right now, except for um, one, and that is when you're sort of finished to, to re-show us your uh, sketchbook, because people like that. Oh, okay. Well, let me say right now, uh, something I, I, before I forget, um, Sonoma County Art Trails, they are hoping that studios will be open to the public okay. in September. And that's September 18, 19, and 25, 26. And I can't remember, there are probably, I think, 150 artist studios open. Two years ago, last year, we could choose to be open to the public or not. Mm -hmm. That's um, Sonoma Art Trails. Yes, or, Sonoma or County Sonoma. Art Trails. Uh-huh. And that's like open studios for the county? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm doing is, this is still reading very, uh, that purple is showing through too much. So I've taken a, a grayish blue over the rocks and they're, they're sitting back nicely now. I might use some of that same grayish blue for some trees down in the valley, a little closer because it's fairly dark. 
but because I've already got one layer of that purple underneath, this is not showing up as much as it did on the rocks. I'm also not pressing nearly as hard. Okay, I might even use that same blue for some of the shadows in these trees. Now, as I make shadows behind the highlights in the rock, that's gonna make them jump out even more. So I'll probably have to tone them down some more. But right now I'm getting things in the ballpark a little more. Now, if I wanted to bring some more attention to these trees right here, I could go, this is a very um, bright yellow green. And I'll just have to see, is that too intense? I'm actually looking in the mirror, it doesn't look all that strong. Um, most important right now would be to break up this a little more. Now, I, I was curious, would it be valuable for me to, when I'm finished with this, send it to you? That would be terrific. Uh, and then you could send it out to people? Certainly. Okay. That would, that would be very helpful. A nice photograph of that would, uh, I'm sure the uh, members would really appreciate that. Okay. I'll and we can, all, we can also attach it to our, uh, our video, which gets posted to uh, YouTube. I was very impressed uh, with the video of Doug. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's great that you do that. You make that available. Is that available to the public? It is. Oh, that's even better. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just put in that beach. It might be a little, it's too strong right now. Um, but as I tone it down a little bit, It'll sit back a little farther. It'll sink in. Um, I didn't get much underneath the fog bank that I talked about. So this is just, this is a very pale lavender, but it's a little richer, got a little more pigment in it than the colors I've used up higher. So uh, yeah, looking in the uh, mirror, the one thing I wanna do is darken that and I'm not finding, oh, okay. We'll go with what reads as black in my hand, but up here it does not. And I'm only doing it in the middle of the trunk so that if I wanna lighten it on either side, if there's a little highlight, a little sunshine hitting, the trunk on this side, I can do that. Um, I might do a little test. If, here was a place where I tipped the pastel up. And I'm actually, this is something I would do much farther into the painting. I was going to post also the website for Sonoma Art Trails so okay. that uh, people can get on their mailing list if you'd like to find out more about that. That'd be great. And, and, that's also, something, and that's something, Clark, that you uh, present your work in, is that right? Uh, yes. I also uh, teach Zoom classes. And I don't, uh, there will be a uh, plein air Zoom class where it might be a little challenge for, for you folks to get up here by 9.30 in the morning. Um, this won't be until May. Um, but I also do Zoom classes out of my studio where you don't have to travel. And um, as I said, I'm in the middle of one session now, but I'm sure there'll be more. Um, Clark, do you, uh, do you post those on your website? I do, yes. And also I think I gave you the address for the Sebastopol Center for the Arts. Okay. And that's, that's um, or I can again, if, if, if you need it. And that's who puts on the Zoom classes. I'm posting that on our chat. Great. 
Hey, Clark, it's looking good. Well, thank you. Is it Doug? Yeah. I guess I can put, I can look at faces now. <laughs> How are you? Well, I'm very good. And you? Yeah, we're staying good. Good. I've gotten a lot of artwork done in the last year and a lot of gardening done. <laughs> okay. Have you ever uh, posted a video of your studio? I have not. I think and people would be amazed at that building. That's one of the things they ask us to do for our trails is, is create videos. And I thought I would two years ago and I never did. So maybe that's a goal. I've got plenty of time before September. So that's a good idea, Doug, thank you. I'll write that down as soon as we close the meeting. Okay, right now, this trunk is looking too straight across and it should be going downhill. So I'm going to reinforce that it's maybe even take it too far at first. I tend to do that, be a little extreme initially. And then sometimes I decide, ooh, that really looks pretty good. Other times I think, oh boy, pull back on that. But um, better than being too timid, I think. So I'm using that almost black color to do some trunk work now. They're all about the same fatness and they're right opposite each other. So I'll play around. Um, but that's the kind of thing I would see in the mirror. Thank you so much. We've gotten some really nice feedback from people. Uh, very entertaining. Thank you. Uh, and anyone who'd uh, like to unmute themselves and say something to Clark about uh, the presentation, you're welcome to do that. Uh, love the inspiring demo. Great. It says Pamela. Thank you, Pamela. Love your sky. Oh, says, good. Says Katie. So thank you. Well, we want to thank you again very much. Uh, uh, the, the group is expressing their appreciation. That was a wonderful performance oh. and uh, great presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You. There it is. A little more. Thank you very much. Head on. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a good night. You too. <laughs>